Next speaker is Dennis Ivey, and if you're familiar with AppRite or Traversy Media or Free Code Camp, you have probably seen something that Dennis has worked on. He is a developer advocate, an instructor, and importantly for today, he has been in the room during hiring decisions at a whole bunch of different companies, and he's here to talk to us about pretty common mistakes that developer ma developers make in the hiring process, which is going to be very valuable for all of us. So please welcome Dennis Ivey to the stage. Thank you, Aaron. Good luck. All right. Uh, first of all, I got a quick question for everyone. Uh, how many people have interviewed for a job that they thought that they were the perfect fit for, and you went through several rounds and you got some kind of rejection, even though you thought you were the perfect candidate? All right. A lot of people in here. So this is what I want to talk about today. And one thing I want to preface this with is, first of all, the tips that I'm going to give are things that I've seen people do in interviews that hurt their chances. And they're going to be very simple things that affect a lot. At the same time, I can't always say why someone didn't get hired for the job. I've had situations where we've had perfect candidates. We've interviewed them. They seemed like the right fit, and on paper they are. But maybe they weren't there they weren't the perfect person for the time, I guess. There are certain jobs that we need to fill a role, and a candidate is perfect but doesn't fit into those exact needs. So a lot of this is out of your control. And in many cases, we've brought back those candidates for other positions, maybe for that same job, but a couple months later. So the thing I want to make sure you do that is if you don't, if you don't pass an interview, it's not always on yourself. It's not always something that you did. There's certain things that are out of your control, so don't beat yourself up about it. It's an annoying process. Now, what I want to focus on are the things that we can control. So in this process, there's humans involved, and that means it's going to be a flawed system. Sometimes there's just another candidate that was maybe more qualified. Maybe the person you interviewed had a bad day. They had a fight with their wife that day, and they just weren't in the mood, and then they interviewed someone else a day later, and they happened to be in a better mood. Those things we can't control. What we can control are those common, simple mistakes. So we're going to talk about these five mistakes. They're going to be tips and just things that you can do. And by the way, this QR code will be up there after. Uh, this is just going to take you to my website. Any social links, YouTube, Twitter, anywhere you want to connect, you can find me there. That'll be up after this, and we can chat about this. So the first thing is people hire people they vibe with. This is a kind of going to be the tone for the rest of this talk. And I'm going to start with a quick story here. When I was a kid, I used to do a lot of odd jobs around the neighborhood. I wanted some extra money. I had brothers. So we'd go knock on doors. We would see if somebody wanted their lawn mowed, fence painted, weeds pulled, whatever we can do. And we'd often have more of the elderly type usually accept our offer, right? They maybe couldn't work on something their own. Maybe they were a widower and they just didn't have the ability to do the work themselves. And some young kids come by, offer to do some work. They don't mind. Go ahead and do this. So we would get the job done. We would paint the, the fence, mow the lawn, pull the weeds, whatever it was. And oftentimes what would happen is after the job, on a summer day, there was nothing more that we wanted to do than go home meet up our friends, and go to the river together, right? We're kids, we should be doing what kids should be doing. And we would get invited usually to sit down and just have a chat, have a soda, and just talk to whoever we worked for, right? Usually these people were a little bit lonelier. They were, again, living alone, so they liked having the company. And the funny thing that I noticed about this process was that the people that we connected with better, the ones that we had a good conversation with, the ones that we built a relationship with, would often find more work for us to do. It was often just having a chat on a back patio and they would just say, hey, can you come back tomorrow and maybe get that raccoon out of the bushes over there or just anything they can think of. And I noticed that it wasn't that what I did was so great. It was that they simply liked having us around. It was just company. And I realized that we humans are not always making logical decisions, right? We don't always make decisions on what's practical. The lawn was done, everything was complete. They made decisions based on emotions. And in this case, they just liked having us there. And this is something that I took on throughout the rest of my career, right? I understood the value of connecting with someone and realizing that this plays probably one of the biggest impacts when we're comparing ourselves against technical skills, right? You're gonna compete with somebody in a job interview that might qualify at the same level as you do, but the person that shines, the person that stands out a little bit more in that sense, that connects better, usually stands out a little bit more. And for us technical people, we often 
kind of look down on this. I talk to a lot of developers when I coach them up for this. I often highlight the importance of this process. And a lot of times people almost want to say, you know what? I want to focus on my skills, right? I'm really good at what I do. I can code. I can build these solutions. And it almost feels fake to try to work on the interpersonal skills. And this is one of the biggest flaws. And to me, there's nothing fake about caring how you make someone feel and how you approach someone. So a little bit of self-evaluation and work on yourself and just seeing how people think of you matters quite a bit. So this is going to be kind of the tone for that. This has a big impact. And remember, people hire people they vibe with. They're going to be with you for a long time, working hours. They're always going to be connected to you. And they don't want to work with someone they don't like. So the second thing is the technical challenge, right? So in a lot of jobs, we'll, we'll usually see like a leak code style question or like these data structures and algorithms questions. Uh, the one that I like to give when I'm conducting an interview is I like to have an incomplete function or just a broken bit of code. And I'll usually just leave it out there, describe what's happening, very minimal stuff, and then just have the candidate try to solve it. And I just kind of let them start breaking down the process. Now, the bad thing to do in this process is to try to solve the problem right away. So if you don't know it, what oftentimes candidates will do is they'll just sit quietly for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and then they'll start getting fidgety and they'll start apologizing for taking too long. You can feel the pressure. And then they just kind of sit quietly until they can resolve the problem. And what I'm actually looking for is not just the answer. I don't want to know that you can solve this challenge. Of course, that's important. But I want to see how you think. This is our first chance to evaluate and actually get to work together, right? When you're working in a real job, you're going to have other developers. You're going to have a manager, somebody that you take problems to, and we interact here. So the ideal solution is to start acknowledging what's, what, what, what do you see out there? What's the code? Start going line by line, describing it, asking questions, following up with that. Now, the cool thing about this is that if a candidate struggles and they don't know the answer to the question, if they start evaluating it, I can give some hints. And again, I've been on the other side of this where I've had people start giving me hints into what's happening, and then it kind of comes to me, right? There's a lot of pressure during this process. Sometimes our brain just doesn't work the way it's supposed to. And when you're thinking out loud, you're able to actually show the person what you're thinking, and they can understand and maybe empathize with you a little bit. And again, they'll give you hints. And if you don't know that problem, if you don't know the answer to the problem, I know in school, uh, I had teachers that would often say, if you show the work, you at least get half the credit. Have we ever had that before? I think that's a pretty common thing, right? If you show the work, I can at least be more understanding and maybe figure out where your skill sets are at and where your weaknesses are. But if you don't tell me anything, I, I don't know. If you do know the answer, don't solve it right away. Still break it down, think through it. Because I don't know if maybe you just happen to prepare for this question. This just happens to be one of those things you are ready for. And it doesn't let me evaluate this. So still, take your time. Start working together. And we can vibe and figure this out. So make sure to take up the time during a technical question and understand it's not about solving the problem. It's about actually going through it. So... Uh, a lot of athletes, uh, musicians, I'm sure there's other areas people practice in, but we understand this concept right here, but yet when it comes to the job, a lot of times we ignore it. And in sports, so I'm a three-sport athlete. I wrestled, played football, track and field. I remember being a kid in high school and having to learn a certain play in football, something that you just have to do. And we would go through this play. We would learn the sequence of characters we had to remember, and then we would go through it again until everyone kind of figured it out, right? And then the coaches would do this annoying thing where they'd make us do it a couple hundred times. It was just over and over and over again. And it got so repetitive to the point where we just felt sick of running the same play every single time. And if you're a musician, you just do the same thing over and over again. Now, in sports, we understand this concept because when the stadium lights go on, when there's fans in the crowd and there's one minute left on the clock, your brain is not going to remember a long sequence of events or any other sport where you have a certain move you need to make. This needs to be second nature because your brain will lock up. It doesn't think about that stuff. And it needs to be something that you just do instinctively without even realizing it. Now, I've talked to some people here and I talked to a lot of developers that have gone through this where some of us have been out of a job for three months, six months, maybe a year. And I'll tell you right now, there's more pressure when the bills are piling up the credit cards, credit card debt is just not looking so good. Marriage issues start occurring because of financial problems. And we go into an interview with all this stress and we need to get this job. And when we ignore something like practice right here, 
We lock up, the nerves kick in, this stuff becomes very obvious. And it's hard to perform when we're not ready for it. And when I'm talking about practice, I'm talking about two types here. I'm talking about first, understanding answers to common questions. You can literally Google these up or talk to anybody who's conducted an interview or even been in one, right? Uh, tell, me, tell me about a time when you had an issue with a coworker and you were able to resolve it. Tell me about a time when you had a technical challenge and what methods did you use to solve these? In the interview, you don't want to lock up during these questions, right? Because you can't always just think of them off the top of your head. But you want to be so ready, have these answers so ready to go that you can just answer them with confidence, even though underneath you're stressed out, you're shaken, and you don't know what to do. But you just perform because it's second nature. Then I'm talking about the other type of practice. I'm talking about going through the interview process. The more you do it, to some people this doesn't even apply, by the way. If you're just not nervous, go ahead, do your thing. That's great. I don't have to practice anymore. But going through this process, understanding what to expect, it's usually about an hour, these are the type of things that they ask, and just practicing with your wife, your husband, your kids, your dog, stand in a room and just talk to the wall if you need. It feels super awkward. But getting ready, going through these iterations, takes that pressure off. So even though we're nervous, we can perform under that pressure because it's second nature to us. And that way you can focus on the things that matter. The hard questions, you're able to pay attention to those because all that stuff that's relatively easy to answer, right? Most of us can tell us about, tell someone about our goal, right? But in an interview, I've been asked this early on where so I've been asked about my future goals, what I want to do with the company, and it's, you, you don't really have the right words to use and you want to have this ready to go. All right, so do your homework. I don't really have good titles for these, by the way, so I'll just explain them. This honestly surprises me. Uh, a lot of developers that I interview, I'm often surprised how few people understand the role they're applying for or even the job. And this happens quite a bit. And I'm talking about just understanding the company themselves. I understand that we have a lot of applications, we're mass applying, and then we'll maybe schedule five interviews after, at, out of maybe 100 or more applications we fill out. By the time you get that interview, the least you can do is spend 15 minutes on the company's documentation, 15, 20 minutes maybe, understand what the company does. Understand some key tools, their market, maybe look up some competitors, come ready to go because questions around this will usually come up. The other thing that I personally like to do, and it, it could sound weird, but I stalk the people that are about to interview me. I will, usually in the invite link, when you're on a Google Calendar meet, you usually have the email of the person that's gonna be in the interview. I look up the company profile, look up employees on LinkedIn, and then I look up that person, their name, their company, and I just put them into Google. And usually you'll find social media posts that they've made, things that they've talked about, their common interest, initiatives that the company is working on. And when you come ready to go, and knowing about this person, you can bring these things up in conversation, like lesson one, where people wanna work with people they vibe with. When you know the person, you can bring these up. Sometimes the conversation can get uncomfortable. You're talking to someone that you normally wouldn't socially hang out with. So when it gets uncomfortable, you can ask the question, oh, I'm really curious about this post you made on AI in the future, you know, relating to this topic in 2026. That was really cool. I saw your company did this thing last year. How did that go? So you're showing this curiosity and now you've created things to talk about. I've seen podcasts where a podcast host won't do their research on a guest and the conversation is just flat. They really can't go deep. So this is the kind of preparation I'm talking about. Just be aware of this stuff. And as far as knowing the company, I've created a filter and I've seen people use this where in the early stages of the interview, I'll ask and I'll just ask the candidates, what do you know about our company? What do we do? And I'll just kind of throw out some vague questions there. And if a candidate can't answer that, to me, that's one of the biggest filters to know that we're probably gonna end the interview early and we're not gonna respond. It sounds harsh, but to me, the least you can do is at least know what we're about and see if you're a good fit. So do your homework, make sure you know the company and the person you're interview with, interviewing with. It's not that much time. By the time you get it, spend 10 to 15 minutes there. At the end of the interview, or towards the end, most people will leave 10 to 20 minutes for some questions, right? They'll ask you, do you have any questions for us? This opportunity right here is one you wanna take. Ideally, you prep questions in advance, right? You look up things during that research phase or you're really focused during the interview and you're taking notes on things you wanna bring up later. And it's allowing you to show interest in the company. Good questions are things like, what does success look like in this role? What are common issues that you're facing that I can immediately make an impact on? 
you're engaged and it keeps the conversation going. Now, if you don't have any questions, that's fine, but you still should use this chance. If something came up during the interview, make sure to address that. You know what? You talked about this specific thing. Uh, I really wanted to know about that, and you addressed that perfectly. I was also curious about X, Y, Z, and I feel like you covered that well. At this point, I don't have any questions, but can I email you if I do? Because I think we had a good conversation. I just can't come up with anything off the top of my head. So that still shows you are engaged. You just don't want to miss that opportunity and leave it because they're giving you another chance to keep presenting who you are. So that's the end of the talk. Uh, those are five tips that you can use and just be aware of in an interview. Now, I'm not going to guarantee you, guarantee you any success, but from what I've seen, the candidates that get hired usually perform these well. They're able to show their ability, they build rapport, and of course, if you're actually qualified for the job, this will drastically improve your chances. And that's the link for my website. If you want to scan that, connect with me after, uh, that'll take you there. So I actually didn't test it, but it should work. <laughs> oh. I hope, I hope the link does work. That was yeah. awesome. <laughs> very, very cool to get behind the scenes from a hiring perspective. Um, that first slide, people hire people they vibe with. I can imagine people are out there feeling frustrated about that um, because it's like, listen, I can do the job. I'm very smart. I'm capable. I, I'll perform. So how do we, as, as engineers, learn these soft skills knowing that that was the number one slide you put up there? And I think it's true. How do, we, how do we pick up those soft skills? How do we learn that? How do we learn to like express that in an interview? I think it's self-awareness, okay. but it's also just practicing. Get feedback. A lot of us will get feedback from people that love us, and they will oftentimes not give us the best feedback, and see if you do anything that's off-putting or if you actually connect. I think being just true to yourself and understanding that is going to make a big impact. And in terms of like... You said you just get flooded with, with resumes. In terms of like AI-generated cover letters, spray and pray to a thousand jobs, what are some things that you can, as, a, as somebody who's seeking a job, do to get around that, that onslaught of like just yeah. crap resumes that are coming in? Well, I don't like the mass applying thing. I think that's just a spray and pray effect that doesn't work too well. Mm -hmm. I'm much more of be specific in where you want to apply tailor their resume or the application to the company, and I'm not a fan of the AI-generated stuff, mm -hmm. I think you do need to take your time. When you're more targeted, when you maybe do research on the people in advance, try to form a connection. See if you know anybody there. That's much more effective when you're able to get that in. So focus more on being more precise as opposed to mass applying, because the AI filters, they're going to filter out a lot of people, especially if that isn't customized. So, so you, you would recommend fewer, better applications yes. and put in some effort into the cover letter and show Absolutely. that you know a little bit about what's going on. Absolutely. If you can find someone that is working at that company, see if you can connect. Don't go to a hiring manager and ask them for the job. You don't want to do that. Right. But see if there's certain ins that you can get. I know it's not ideal. It's, it's actually very unfair, right? We're, we're mm -hmm. qualified for a job. We should be able to get it, but we don't live in an ideal world. Correct. And the, the matter of fact is that people do make decisions emotionally, whether they know it or not, and that's just going to happen. And that's why this talk you gave is so valuable. Y'all give it up for Dennis. <laughs> Good job. Thank you.